like his mother when he says that. <laughs> I called her Mrs. Meath for a long time before I got to mum. <laughs> so, yeah. Has anybody been through Emerald Airport? I'm interested. Ed, put your hand up if you've been through the Emerald Airport, the little, only you, with me. Okay. Oh, maybe I'll forget that story. <laughs> no, 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 I'll tell you. Um, it's, 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 it's a strange feeling because you, you go in and you check in and maybe you've been to another country link airport, so it'll be a similar thing. You go in, you check in, the guy, you know, takes everything, prints out your, bo your boarding pass and all of that stuff and then he tells you where you go to wait. For you, you just go through a short little place and then you sit there and this has happened to John and I numerous times when our family lived in Emerald. And we would sit there and this one time I watched and I said, John, the guy that is getting all the baggage and putting it on the little cart, the same guy that checked us in. And he said, oh, it is too. And then we watched him and he did it all. He loaded the plane with all of our things and then he jumped off his little cart and then we went, we got called and we went up to board the plane. And yes, he was standing there taking our boarding passes off us and checking us off there and looking somewhat anxiously over at his other desk to book pit the next lot in um, and then have a good flight. Um, and I almost expected him to be on the plane. <laughs> but of course he has to check the next lot in. Um, and we would see this repeated all the time with the, the, this little guy that would just run over and he would be everyone. Well, I'm only telling you that long story to let you know that when I finish here, I'll be serving you up the back with milk and tea and coffee. <laughs> and it sort of felt a bit like the John and Josie show today. But anyway, that's okay. Let's chill and we'll be fine. And I'll, and I'll be putting your milk in a bit later. I'll try and run down and shake your hand at the door as well. Good old Emerald. Okay, I'm really happy to be sharing what I'm sharing with you today because I believe God's you know, laid this one on my heart a few weeks ago. Probably in my counselling room, actually, and it was, it's been percolating away. Um, so it's called King David Has a Secret, as you can see. Um, and so my introduction is that I'm going to tell you that David did have a secret at winning in life. I won't tell you what it is until the very end, um, but you might discover it as we go along and figure it out. Um, but David had a secret and he knew how to overcome. He knew in spite of his difficulties, he was going to win at life. Sounds good, right? Maybe we can figure, what that, figure out how that is when, as I go along. Did you notice that we sang a song today that's actually a creed? Oh, can you hear me? Did I just boom? Okay, I, I felt like I boomed. All right. A creed is simply a formal statement of Christian beliefs which guides its followers to actions. That's what I found in the, lang in the Oxford Languages Dictionary. Um, but David had his own creed, and today I'm going to open up for you Psalm 116, which as I read through it, I see it as David's personal creed. His, his cry out to the Lord. There are all kinds of creeds floating around. Um, in fact, I think there's about 150, I looked this up too, and there's about 150 different creeds that the Christian church believes in and promotes actively. The most commonly is the Apostles and the Nicene, I would think. H hands up anyone who went to one of those churches where the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed and you repeated it, regularly got it into your system and that is what you rehearsed. I love the song that we sang today. Thank you, Wendy and the team, for the beautiful worship again today. Teresa, Larry, you're all amazing. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Pardon? He's, it's annoying me and him. Hello, everyone online. This is my husband. <laughs> I'm going to start again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, darling. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. 
And it's as simple as that. It's not a big scary thing that we think, oh, these churches that chant it and repeat it and you know, go over and over it. It's actually wonderful to have this creed that we can say this is what we believe in. This is what I believe in and to know where we stand. I heard you while we were singing that, joining with, with each other, just affirming, weren't we? I believe, I believe, I believe and it stirs us up. Hillsong brought that out. Personally, I think it's one of their best songs anyway. Um, I don't know why our churches, you know, the charismatic churches don't really seem to have creeds and do all that. I'm not sure why, but um, I guess maybe we don't like the idea of doing things by rote all the time and we see it like that. Perhaps that's it. Perhaps we believe the whole Bible is, you know, it's our creed, the whole Bible. We don't have to take a little bit. I'm not sure why, but that's not my point today. We do need to understand that memorizing and repeating these creeds will never save us. They won't ever save us from our sins. That, I think, is the difference. Nothing wrong with doing it, but it won't save us, especially not if that's where our hope is in that. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And he's the only one that can ever save us. Obviously, we know religious rituals won't do it. Could we pray? Lord Jesus, I, I thank you, Lord, that, that we can make a statement of faith, a strong summary of our principles of faith back to you, Lord, our, our, what we believe in, Lord. And I just ask that as I open up your word today and we take a peek into King David's life, Lord, that we'll be able to find your grace amongst this, Lord, and to just hear what it is that you want to hear, Lord. I pray that I would be able to preach and teach this word faithfully, Lord, with your anointing um, on it, Lord, so that we can understand and, and uh, we can just learn more about you again today and what you've done in our lives. Thank you for that. Amen. Rightio. The psalmist, King David. He believes very firmly in making statements of his faith, not ever in rituals where you know he would, he would, he f he thought his salvation in God had to be in that. I don't see that, but certainly if you read the Psalms, you will see that David makes these statements of faith. It's like he's speaking to his own soul, isn't it? And he's just over and over and over again pouring out his belief system back to God. Maybe reminding himself what he believes in because he had a lot of troubles. We'll see soon many of them he brought on himself, but anyway, he had a lot of troubles. The psalm I want to examine today, which to me, um, well, actually theologians have called this David's Creed, and it's Psalm 116, one of my favourites. We'll wait till that, there we go. It's in the Passion Translation there for you today. So if you're not reading with the Passion Version, feel free to look up at your screen. I'll, it, it will take a few minutes, so let me just read it to you. I am passionately in love with God because he listens to me. He hears my prayers and he answers them. As long as I live, I will keep praying to him for he stoops down to listen to my heart's cry. Death stares me in the face and I am close to slipping into dark shadows. I am terrified. I am overcome with sorrow. I cried out to the Lord, God, come and save me. He was so kind, so gracious to me. Because of his passion towards me, he made everything right and he restored me. So I've learned from my experience that God protects the childlike and the humble ones, for I am broken and brought low. But he answered me and he came to my rescue. Now I can say to myself and to all, relax and rest, be confident and serene, for the Lord rewards fully those who simply trust in him. God has rescued my soul from death's fear and dried my eyes of many tears. He's kept my feet firmly on his path and strengthened me so that I will please him and live my life before him in his life-giving light. 
Even when it seems I am surrounded by many lies and my own fears, and though I am hurting in my suffering and trauma, I will stay faithful to God and speak words of faith. So now, what can I ever give back to God to repay him for the blessings he's poured out on me? I will lift up his cup of salvation and praise him extravagantly for all he has done. I will fulfill the promise I made to God in the presence of his gathered people. When one of God's holy people despairs, it is costly to the Lord, touching his heart deeply. Lord, because I am your loving servant, you have broken open my life and freed me from my chains. Now I will worship you passionately and I will bring you my sacrifice of praise drenched with thanksgiving. I will keep my promise to you, God, in the presence of your gathered people, just like I said I would. I will worship you here in your living presence in the temple of Jerusalem. I will worship and sing hallelujah for I praise you, Lord. It's good, isn't it? You see why they call it his personal creed? Because he's reminding himself of his troubles, but what he's going to do about it, how he can keep looking to the Lord. He keeps thanking Jesus. What I noticed just a few weeks ago as I was sort of thinking about all of this is that David is using the very tools that I use almost, I told you I was going to be, you know, down the back and whatever, now you're getting counsellor, sorry. Uh, But I do, I use it almost every day in my counselling practice, the tools of cognitive behaviour therapy. (laughs) Ever had it? No, don't put your hand up. It's okay. (laughs) I love it. I love it. CBT. Would you guys like a dose of cognitive behaviour therapy this morning? (laughs) I promise I'll move on quickly, but it's really good. It's totally free. It's on the house today. The practice of cognitive behaviour therapy was first developed in the 1960s by this guy, Dr. Aaron T. Beck, who discovered CBT at the University of Pennsylvania where he worked and did his life research. 1960. But I'm sorry, Dr. Beck, but actually this type of therapy is strewn throughout the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. He He might have discovered it in the more recent times, but it's been there all along. It was actually God's idea. It was God's idea, and I'm going to show you how David figured that out. The Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, inspired by God's own words to us, tells us that, no, it wasn't the 1960s. It is thousands of years old, and it works. Cognitive behaviour therapy is based on the belief that what we think in our thoughts... How we process our thoughts will outwork in our behaviour. It's very simple. In a little nutshell, whatever we dwell on, whatever we allow our minds to think on, dwell on, percolate, we will find that we're soon behaving according to those thoughts. Sound familiar to you? Yeah, and you only have to read the Bible, don't you, to find out that there's scriptures littered I found a few for you today, but the Bible is full of scriptures about our mind and how we should be getting control of that because we will act out what we think. Uh, Let's take a look at Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Why? Because our behaviour will reflect. Romans 7.23, but there is something else deep within me, Paul said, in my lower nature that it is, is at war with my mind. And he knew that his, his lower nature needed to be changed, but he also recognised that it was coming from here and it was causing a war in his mind. There's many, many more, but I'll leave you with those ones. Don't you love Teresa's slides? <laughs> They're awesome. That's a brain. I love it. took me a minute to work that out, but anyway... 
Okay, in this psalm, you will notice that David is not afraid to admit the depths of despair that he encountered physically and spiritually. But what did he do? He gave himself the permission to face his truths, to accept what he was going through. His, it, it was his reality, and he knew that he needed to face that, and he needed to know his reality. He gave himself permission, just in cognitive behaviour, He gave himself permission, but he knew he must not get stuck there. That's the whole thinking behind it is, yes, realize what's going on, but don't wallow. Don't give yourself permission to stay in that place. You have to move on. And so David clearly makes a conscious decision to action his way right out of his troubles. When I read this passage, I see a man who is um, doing what I I also um, show people a lot, and that is, and you probably already do this, but that is have yourself a self-chat every now and again. Sit yourself down and have someone's nodding at me frantically back there. Yes, it works. Sit yourself down and every now and again give yourself a self-chat. Okay, a self-talk. I know I, I, I have to do that. It's like, a, it's like my own little pep talk. Um, and this is precisely what I see in this Psalm 116. I know I've read it already, but I'm going to stroll through this and I'm going to go through verse by verse again for you pretty much um, as I just open up this little bit. Okay, you'll notice that when David... We'll go back to the slide previously, sorry guys up the back I do want that sugar coating that's it okay you'll notice when John you didn't really fix it okay he's my fix it man normally okay he you'll notice that David you know as he starts out and he warms up to his situation he tells us what he's going through and he doesn't sugarcoat it does he he uses some pretty strong words he tells it like it is and I call those the I am statements his reality okay good old david is doing his cognitive behavior therapy already let's look at verse one and two i am passionately in love with god because he listens to me he hears my prayers and he answers them as long as i live i will keep praying to him for he stoops down to hear my heart's cry or listen to my heart's cry i want you to notice that after proclaiming his experience i am passionately in love with god on the positive he starts which is lovely he switches tack and he gets into that self-talk he switches his tack and now he says as long as i live i will keep praying to him he's talking to himself he's geeing himself up he's he says he stoops down to listen to my heart's cry So he's talking to himself, come on, David, come on, David, as long as you live. So this is where I see the I am's, and you'll see them in highlight here, the I am's in yellow. They are our realities, and the I wills are what we're going to do about it so we don't get stuck there. Verses 3 to 6, death stares me in the face, and I am close to slipping into dark shadows. Listen how bad it got for David. I am terrified. I am overcome with sorrow. I cried out to the Lord. There's a grown man. He's crying. He's on his knees sobbing for help. God, come and save me. He was so kind and gracious to me because of his passion toward me. He made everything right and he restored me. So I've learned from my experience that God protects the child and like and the humble ones for, here we go, look how bad it got. I am broken and brought low. David is definitely in a dark place and acknowledging his humanity. He's hung it out for all of us to see and perhaps you can relate to King David on some level. At the moment, maybe it's been a week like that for you. After acknowledging God's compassion toward him, he returns back to his current personal experience and he finishes verse 6 by confirming that he is indeed broken and brought low. But I want to jump to verse 10 and 11 where he goes on. Even when it seems I am surrounded by many lies and my own fears, and though I am hurting in my suffering and my trauma, I will stay faithful to God and speak the words of faith. I love it. 
David seems to recognize that he cannot remain in that place surrounded by hurt and fear. He can't. He can't remain there. He'll go under and he knows it. After acknowledging the the pain, he makes that declaration, more self-talk, I'm going to stay faithful, I'm going to stay faithful to you. I can just picture David, you know, he's probably still pacing in his cave and scared of his enemies and the people that were coming to kill him and terrorize him and he's he's giving it, I will stay faithful, I will I will speak words of faith, I will speak words of faith. Um, and he goes on and on, David's creed. S- verse 12 and 14, so now... What can I ever give back to God to repay him for all the blessings that he poured out on me? I will lift up his cup of salvation and praise him extravagantly for all he's done for me. I love the way he... he, David doesn't finish with praise him, does he? Extravagantly. He's now wanting to jump around and the joy is overtaking him. I will fulfill the promise I made to God in the presence of his gathered people. Lord, we continue in verse 15 and 17 for the slides. Lord, because I am your loving servant, you have broken open my life and freed me from my chains. I will worship you passionately. First he's extravagant, now he's passionate, and I will bring you my sacrifice of praise drenched with thanksgiving. I love the language. Can you see what's happened here? David's frame of mind has shifted. He, it, it, it is shifting. He's working still towards it, I think. Um, and actually, in my industry, we'll call that reframing. It's a simple thing. It's called reframing. He's shifting his thoughts. He's not dwelling on the change. Did you notice the way that is worded? He doesn't dwell on his chains. He doesn't come out going, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally bound in chains. I'm locked in chains. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He, he says this. He says, you have broken open my life and freed me from my chains. He put a different slant on it. He didn't even say, oh, Lord, come and break open the chains. He said, you have freed me from my chains, which is looking at it again on the, the thankful side of it. He's acknowledging those positive I ams. I am your loving servant. I am your loving servant. He's getting more and more excited, isn't he, and more and more passionate about God, the God of healing, the God of power, the God that breaks every chain. Could have sang that today too, but, you know, we d- we'll do that another day. <laughs> okay, verse 18 and 19. I will keep my promise to you, God, in the presence of your gathered people. Just like I said I would, I will worship you here in your living presence in the temple of Jerusalem. I will worship and sing hallelujah, for I praise you, Lord. He's now singing. This guy can't be stopped. I'm now picturing David. He's out of that cave. He can't be in there anymore. He's now on the mountain wherever that is, out in the open where his enemies could maybe come and see him. If you've read David's stories, that was his life. He was a guy who fled to the hills regularly because they would have killed him otherwise. So he hid. And, and, but no, he's out, he's out, he's jumping around, he's got joy. He said, I will, I will worship and sing hallelujah. And I believe he probably did. Burst into song to Jesus. More of that good singing self-talk, reminding him how he also promised God. I love that bit, actually. I love the way that... Um, you notice, you know, he, he, he turns it around and he says, you promised me things, but I also promised you things, God. He says, I did, in front of all the gathered people. That was when he's going back to when he was anointed by Samuel. And Samuel anointed him, and at, at, we'll, we'll hear in a minute about how, what, what God said at that time to King David as he became king. But he is going back and reflecting, you know what, everything I said in front of all those people, I still mean today and I'm going to keep that promise. I'm not going under. That's what he said. I'm also a promise keeper, he said. I just love it. I think this guy has had an amazing change of thinking, just did it himself, just did his self-talk along with the Lord's Holy Spirit anointing him. He starts changing his thoughts King Solomon wrote this, Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, 
so he is. Another one of those scriptures that says, as we think, so we will be. And who was King Solomon's father? David, David thank you. The son has learnt, hasn't he? King Solomon has learnt this wonderful truth from his daddy, David. Solomon would have watched his father, I believe, turn many a dark situation, a dark thought into an opportunity to trust and to walk even closer with God. Was David perfect? No, he definitely wasn't. Who was King Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Okay. Bathsheba, she was the woman that David would have an affair with. Not just an affair, he coveted her so much he wanted her for himself and he was determined to get her and he didn't want everyone to know the sneaky, terrible, evil way that he went about it, but he, he coveted her until he got what he wanted, which we all know is a, a dreadful sin, even just the coveting. He sent her, her husband, Uriah, out to the front lines of battle because he was a soldier and he knew that Uriah would get killed out there because all the men in the front lines were getting mown down. So only the very bravest of the brave would go out in those front lines. They would do it because they knew they had to lay their life down. But David organised for Uriah to be in the front line. That's how sneaky he was, how much he wanted Bathsheba. His plan worked and Uriah was killed and he snatches up Bathsheba and she becomes his wife and he doesn't even have to explain the adultery and everything that was going on. It just stayed very hidden um, and that was our David. It was a horrible, it was a, re it was a really embarrassing, horrible, evil thing that David was bringing on himself. But the contradiction, have you ever thought about it? I'm sure you have, is God saying, this is a man after my own heart. That's what was said, spoken over him when he was anointed by King Samuel. God said, this man shall be king for he is a man after my own heart. God knew David and, and, and his heart. The incident with Bathsheba, by the way, was just one of a string of things. You, you, you can go and take a look at the long list of sins that David committed. I don't want anyone opening up my book and taking a long look at mine, but we have got the Bible so we're, we can see into David's life. He, di he did some amazing things. He not, did, not only did he um, commit adultery, he lied to a priest. That's terrible, isn't it? But he lied to a priest. He faked insanity at one point and he fought as a mercenary for the Israelite army. He was really a bad guy. It's really strange, but I came across a commentary that said that during the time that David was fighting uh, as a mercenary for the, for the Israelite army, he didn't write any psalms. There was not a period of his life where he wrote psalms. I found that really interesting. Perhaps joy and faith sort of dried up a little bit in the midst of that. David also failed as a father, actually, even though Solomon seems to have, have found some good in his dad and has learnt wisdom. He failed as a father. He, he, he failed to correct his, his son um, when, he, had, uh, when he, did, he violated his stepsister. I don't know if you remember that one as well. That was horrific. Um, so he should, I suppose he should have disciplined him and called him out on that and stood up for that woman his, you know, his stepdaughter, but he, no, David did nothing about that and the list actually goes on and on. David's son could have been the shameful son, the forgotten son, the awkward son, the embarrassing son, the son who came out of cheating, adultery, lies and murder, but no, he became the great King Solomon. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that gives me chills. It's, I think it's just God, you know, God's grace, God's grace to this family. He becomes the great King Solomon. And I think David was called a man after God's own heart because of the secret, 
that David found that I talked to you about in the beginning, the secret, that he knew, he knew it, and he knew that he knew that he knew was his creed, and he lived by his creed, he lived by it. This was the secret, let's go to it. David understood that it was important to acknowledge that when things get tough, when we mess up, when we sin, we let God down and others down to repent. Repent at that sin. And when our mind is overwhelming us with fear and doubts, we turn it back over to God. The secret is to joyfully go forward, singing your own creed, just singing out your promises to the Lord. Time and time we fail him. I, d- I know I do. Time and time. And time and time again, we remind ourselves, God is faithful. God is faithful. When we sin, we often want to run away from God. We start doing things like skipping church, like hanging out with a different crowd, um, like questioning our, our very faith. That's what we tend to do as humans. We run from him. But David knew the secret. Deep in his heart, despite everything going on around him, despite knowing that he was far from perfect, he kept pursuing the only one who is. Right? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for David and the life of David and for the lessons that we learn from him, even in this psalm, Lord. And I just ask you, God, that you would teach each one of us how to pursue you, Lord, to know that you are the one, the perfect one, that we can run after. We can run after you, Lord. Teach us how to do that. And I I pray, Lord, for each one of us here today as we go into our week that you would bless and provide for each one as they need it, Lord, and and as you, you provide for them, Lord, may they go out and bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Please don't forget to go. I'm going to repeat um, John's creed, ple- mantra, whatever. Please don't forget to go and say hello to someone that you don't know. If you've spotted someone that's come and you've had them on your mind during the week, go and find them. Give them that encouragement. Thank you. Yeah, because I've got to run up the back.